What are the two key things to look at when working with yoga students or clients with movement limitations or imbalances? And what is the functional significance of the three curves of the spine for structural health and balance? Hello everyone, this is Eva Nolik smith with Yoga You Online and welcome to this free lecture with kinesiologist and yoga therapist Dr. Gil Solberg in which he discusses these two important topics and offers insights into how to observe imbalances in the spine in your yoga students. Gil joins us all the way from Israel. He is the son of Israel's first yoga teacher and as such has been a student of yoga since a very young age. His early exposure to yoga spurred a keen interest in the healing power of movement and he eventually went on to take a doctorate in kinesiology with a specialization in posture disorders in addition to becoming a yoga teacher at a very early age. Since 1994, Gil has been a lecturer at several academic institutions in Israel and he also has a private yoga therapy clinic which offers treatments for disorders of the posture system and movement imbalances. He is also the author of the book Postural Disorders and Musculoskeletal Dysfunction. And he is the co-developer with Amit Algalon of Muscle of Motion uh, of an animated anatomy software on functional yoga anatomy and posture disorders. This free talk is an excerpt from Gil's larger online course on the kinesiology of posture and the biomechanics of healthy aging. Welcome. Talking about some um, kinesiological aspects, we'll have enough time to, to, to get deeper into this, but just want to mention one thing. If I have to deal with something like this, something goes wrong. Okay, it doesn't matter now what. This movement, that movement, something goes wrong. In order to improve it, in any kind of problem or limitation, I divide it into two components, which are very important. First one is building adapted mobilization infrastructure. I don't even know if I put it right when I wrote it. But what I mean is that if, for instance, this person or this student need, in order to make this plank position, very strong serratus anterior muscle, very strong deltoid muscle, very strong core deep transversus muscle, or maybe range of motion in his plantar flexor muscles, it doesn't matter what. First of all, I need to gain these components. In other words, if I want to improve this, the way I lift my hands, and I have a limitation in the pectoralis minor, first of all, I would need to improve somehow the length and flexibility of the pectoralis minor. If I will improve it, it will give me, it, it's sort of a, like a prerequisite. Without this, I cannot move my hands. So this is the easy part, why? Because Muscles are very easy to handle. If a muscle is weak, and I know how to make it strong and no neurological problems on the way, it will get strong, stronger. If a muscle is very <coughs> tight, short, and I know how to stretch it, it will be stretched, I can improve it. Okay? This is the most, I would say, the easiest part of yoga therapy practice. Exercises. Coming up to the second component, building a motor infrastructure, what we call neurological control. Neurological control is much harder to, get, harder to gain. This is everything that is connected to the brain. Coordination, differentiated movement, timing, force regulation, and many other balance, many other components that are depended on the brain, on the proper commands that the brain gets into the body. So we will deal with this because sometimes 
we can see in yoga that the person is strong enough, flexible enough, has anything that, ne that is needed to be done in, in the posture, but doesn't know how to organize his body. This is something to do with the brain. And this is the most difficult component in treatment. And that's why what we need in this kind of improvements in this component, we need time. It takes a long time for the brain to learn. This is not something you can, you can uh, manipulate in 10 minutes. I don't know in the States, how long is a common physical therapy treatment in the public health? In Israel, it's about 20. One session, huh? 20 se no, 20, 20 minutes. 20 minutes per session. Hmm? Half an hour? You don't? Because what I find is yoga therapy, the, the most important thing in yoga, ther in yoga therapy is that you have enough time. Time cures. If you don't have time, you rush up. And then you can do many things, but the brain doesn't get them. So I mention it now, but we will talk about it more later on. It's a big problem in my lifestyle because usually I start my academic work in the beginning of October and then there is six months of very, I would say, lots of work from the morning till the evening and then I take long vacation. Now I am in the beginning, in the middle of the vacation. So I have a lot of energy. Bad for you. <laughs> so you have to make some signs wherever you need a break. Okay? Some people are very direct. They go... Like this. <laughs> some of them... are more polite. Don't be polite. Okay? I think we'll have a few minutes break. But if you need more, tell me how much you need. It's negotiable. <laughs> what I will start uh, now is dealing with some uh, common postural disorders in the sagittal plane in terms of the spine. When we talk about postural problems, we can talk maybe six months about issues that are connected to the lower extremities. And most of my courses in Israel uh, are from 200 hours to 540 hours, the various courses. In all of them, 50% of the time is spent on the lower extremities because there are many connections, many chain reactions. If I take, for instance, the subtalar joint down in my feet and it's in an inverted position or an eversion position, like what we call pes plano valgus, it will cause a chain reaction to the knee, which will come down to a valgus in the knee, and then the joint of the hip, uh, hip joint will be affected and all the way to the pelvis and then upwards to the spine. So I would say in general that chain reactions are like neighbors. If we have problem, say if you're making, I don't know, a noisy party at the seventh floor, the closer neighbors suffer first, okay? Up and down. And then we see that there are some chain reactions. Sometimes people at the first floor suffer from someone who is doing a big mess on the seventh floor. And we see that there's lots of connections between the lower part of the body and the upper part of the body. The spine in itself causes chain reactions and suffers from chain reactions. We'll see that tomorrow. What I want to start with is talking about, is talk about the spinal curves. Just to get to know the importance of the spinal curves in terms of functionality, okay? We know that uh, in many cases of postural problems, we see all kinds of variations in the, in the surgical plane. When I say sagittal is from the side, we will not be talking about scoliosis, which is an imbalanced position in the lateral you know, side, imbalance in the coronal plane. So if we talk about the curves, have you ever seen this uh, figure? It's a very famous figure showing the development of the curves in the beginning stages of life. So, and we have the fetus posture in yoga as well. It has no much room down there. And if we have a look at the, posi at the position or the um, way the spine is uh, uh, organized here, we see that there is a 
continual kyphotic spine, which is a curved spine all over, from the sacrum here, all the way up to C1 in the connection with the skull. Okay? Then, at about four months old of the child, of the baby, okay, after born, we see that one of the first movements are raising hand, uh, head. Okay? As the, the baby raises his head, he would do that if something interested would be forward, otherwise no motivation. But we put many things in order to make him lift his head, right? Why? Because we want him to develop the, the first low dotted curve of the cervical vertebras. So this erector spine, these are the muscles that need to work in order to lift the heavy head of the child. And slowly but surely, they get shortened and stronger and develop the cervical curve, okay? And as he goes on, we start pushing himself. The baby will start come up to a cobra. We don't have to teach uh, how to make cobra for, uh, yeah, for, for, for babies. They will do it anyway. And as he goes upwards into his cobra, the lower back starts to create the lumbar lordosis. Again, muscles contract, getting shorter, getting stronger, and start making these curves. So actually, when you look at the spinal curves in the sagittal plane, we see something quite interesting. In anatomy, we usually divide it like that, and I will use it in the same division. This is the hips. We have C1 to C7. This is the cervical spine, cervical lordosis. Then we have T1 to T12. This is the thorax, the thoracic spine, which is um, in the middle. And then L1 to L5, this is the lordotic um, lumbar lordosis. Okay? And this is the sacrum. So when we have a look at this, having uh, a look at the previous figure, we see that if we look at a, a person standing like that, the thorax, the, the thoracic kyphosis, yeah, was always there. We have been born with that from this stage. But the lordotic the cervical uh, uh, lordotic spine and the lumbar lordotic spine, the lordosis, was combined to this curve. And actually, when we look at this position, it is critical for a proper functioning. Why? We actually have here three very important advantages in terms of functionality. Okay? First one is shock absorption. If we're talking about shock absorption, we see that if I walk, if I run, if I jump, every shock needs to be absorbed. And by the way, the, the way these curves are built, the line of this shock is breaking on the way, on its way upward to the brain. So if we take the spine as a tunnel, like this, and the spinal cord nerves run inside, then the line breaks on its way, the direction is breaks, and actually it helps to absorb the shock. If I will take, for instance, people with flat back, flat back is a nasty problem, I'm telling you. Why? Because when you look at this person, he looks very straight. I never received any girl, for instance, with flat back, uh, that was sent by her mother to the clinic to work on her posture. Why? Because it looks perfect. Very nice posture if you don't look professionally. But people with flat back sometimes have lots of problems in terms of low back pain, mainly because of, one of the reasons is because of uh, shock absorption, which is not uh, optimal. Is this clear? Tomorrow, we will learn another reason why Flat back have lots of lower back problems or lower back symptoms. But for now, uh, this is the first advantage which we talk about. 
The second one is balancing the center of gravity over the support base, which actually allows this, this position of the spinal curves in the sagittal plane allows efficient standing. How? Why is it more efficient? Why is it easier to stand like this? Who has an idea? That's true. Due to the thoracic rib cage. Who said that? Try to think. I want you to think. Why this curves in the sagittal plane help us in our tadasana to stand with not much effort. We don't not want much effort in our standing. We want it to be very balanced and gentle. So how can it help organizing the center of gravity over the support base? Any ideas? I, sorry? Well, it provides room for the organs inside so you don't become lopsided. It's true. It's true. Listen, I, I will explain it in a minute. Very nice. Um, just want you to be aware that our profession is very verbal. Thank God I don't have to teach in the States. Because language is not easy. But our profession is very verbal. And sometimes it's not enough to know something or to understand something. You need to practice how to explain it to your students. They will ask you things. So when I ask you th something, think. You can make mistakes, it's fine. That's the best place to make mistakes, it's here. But practice on explaining to yourself. If we look at this structure, we see that the thoracic spine, T1 to T12, is connected to the rib cage, to the ribs. Okay? And this rib cage inside has lots of organs, heart, lungs, nervous system, blood system. All this is quite heavy. It has a center of gravity. Okay? And this center of gravity needs to fall in the borders of the feet. Is this clear? Try to imagine what would happen if we were built like that. Okay? Straight line. And the ribcage would be here. And the center of gravity falls before the feet. What would happen then? We will have to work very hard in order to avoid falling. Yeah, well, we can, yeah, <laughs> finally. And that's exactly, exactly what happens, for instance, with women in the last stages of pregnancy. The center of gravity goes forward and forward and forward and runs away. Do we see Pregnant women falling down all the, all the time? No, they don't fall down. But the lower back will need to work much harder to avoid falling. Is this clear? The good things with women, that's the main advantage of women, that they are women. Think about a woman that come comes home at the last stages of her pregnancy, what is the first sentence she, he she hears from her husband? When she comes home. <laughs> it's obvious. What she hears when she comes home is, honey, shoes off, lie on your back, do nothing, I'm coming. Okay, <laughs> right? And, he's, and he starts massaging, massaging her feet, right? And is it not like that? In Israel, it's like that. But what happens with men in pregnancy? If men in pregnancy, yeah, we see many men who are in the last stages of the pregnancy, but forever. What will happen then? We see the connection between movement of the center of gravity with low back pain. Okay? And I'm working with an orthopedic surgeon, which is a very good one. He refuses to treat people with overweight, if they suffer from lower back pain, unless they reduce weight. So I just want to show you that because talking about pregnancy, forget about pregnancy, but if we take someone with kyphotic position, what will happen 
in a kyphotic position. In a kyphotic position, center of gravity goes forward. That means that now the position is not balanced. People don't fall, but they have to work very hard to avoid falling. And we see lots of problems in various areas that I will talk about tomorrow, neck, lower back, hamstrings, all the muscles that need to work together to avoid falling, which makes the position or Tadasana very affortive. Can I say that? You need to work very hard in order to just stand. So I would say that the second advantage of the thorax is that the thoracic kyphosis contains internal organs in an efficient and balanced position. Okay? And what we actually want in a Tadasana or in very uh, other positions where we stand, we want to be able to stand with not much effort. We don't want a soldier position like that. Okay, we can hold like that a few seconds, but then you get tired. The third advantage, we'll talk about this uh, tomorrow, uh, about kyphotic position. So don't worry if something is not clear, we'll get deeper. The third uh, advantage, I would like to explain it very well because it's one of the most important things that we check in a postural examination. And what we see is that the structure of this sagittal plane spine allows increased range of movement. Did you know that? If I, how do you, how do you call this? Tape measure. measure, okay. If I measure the length of the spine, somebody is standing and I measure the length of his spine from C1 all the way down to C5, S1. And I'll say, now I measure it as 100 centimeters. I don't know how feet it is. And then, let's call it X. Then I tell him, now, bend forward as we do in Uttanasana, okay? Forward bending. And I will measure again his spine. I will get in a normal range something like X plus 8 to 10 centimeters, which is about how many inches? Six, seven inches more. What we see here is as we bend forward, the curves are merging in a way that if, for instance, I sit like that in a dandasana, very nice position of sitting, in an anterior tilt with good lodotic spine position, from here, if I go to Fashimatanasana, forward bend, we see that the lodotic lumbar curve merges and combines with the kyphotic curve. And while that happens, we get a continuous or sequential arch. This is a phrase, this is a, a definition that we check. It's an examination to see whether we have or not a continual, uh, continuous arch along the vertebral column. It's a subjective examination. When I say subjective examination, it's not by centimeters or inches or, or degrees. <laughs> we have to see and we have to feel. For instance, here you see a continuous arch, right? It's very hard to feel or to see where the lower back ends and the middle back starts. You don't know where the lower lumbar spine ends and the beginning of the thoracic spine starts. This is a good arch. Whereas we see here that we don't have a continuous arch. Okay? You see a big difference between the lower back, which is a bit flat, and the upper back. Now we have to see and to feel many people in order to get this feeling. But what we do uh, when we check this uh, 
a continuous arch, we ask the person to bend forward, and we want to see what's happening with his back. It's something that you could do actually today while working in couples, but we, you didn't have the, the tool yet. Tomorrow you will be able to do that, okay? Have a look at a few samples. Looking at this person, he's a, this patient is under 40 years old, and he can, he already faces big problems tying his shoelaces in the morning, okay? Why? Because he has limitation, quite severe limitation in his lower back. His curves do not merge, okay? Which means limitations of movement. When we see here, this forward band, we can see that the lower back doesn't merge, okay? This shows stiffness. If I would tell this uh, woman to roll over backwards and forward as you did today, in the afternoon, you will hear her lower back. You will see that her lower back doesn't go smoothly. The segments of the lower back don't give their movement to the total movement. We can also see here that the stiffness goes away much more than the lower back. It gets into her thorax, okay? Almost up to here. And here's another sample. Uttanasana with flexed knees, okay? That's the way we look at it. We look at it and we want to see what's happening in the spine while the person is moving in a forward bend. Okay, what we see here is an exaggerated curve in the thoracic spine and no movement here. His lower back or her lower back here is very stiff. Stiff lower back is a good potential to hurt it if we do something uh, which is not suitable. And here again. What we also see is while you don't have merging of the curves, the lever of the movement is very long, which means more tension and more loads on the lower back. Okay? Here again, tomorrow we will learn how to look at it, how to touch, how to feel, how to write what's happening in the lower back. So this is a very important thing. Let me show you, here we see how we actually look at it. As the person stands up in a normal position, we ask him to slowly come down, not with straight back forward, not with any effort to go somewhere down, just very relaxed way to go slowly, vertebra by vertebra, okay? And you can see here how the, the curves are merged. In the beginning, it looks here as if she has a, an exaggerated lordotic spine in the, in the lower back. But as she comes forward, you can see that the curves are merging quite nicely, which means that the potential of movement here is very good. Every vertebra gives what is needed to the total movement. She is doing it in an integrative way. And even if she has a problem, or say a postural problem in her lower back, like hyperlordosis, it's a functional problem and not a structural problem. Why? Because the potential of movement is good. Looking inside the body, You can see here, this is from our software, uh, the theoretical part. So you can see here how we actually look at it. We can check it either in a sitting position or standing position or both, which I prefer. Okay? So from here, as we see the curves in the sagittal plane, start forward bend and we want to see merging of the curves. We look and we touch, and we want to see this continuous out. Is this clear? While we see this, and if it's normal, if it's everything is fine, we see that the segmental movement here, every movement here is very small, but the, main, the, the whole movement is quite big. It is built from segmental movements. 